All right, and all the people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Hannah, for that prayer. Thank you, praise team. Great job, Cade, on your first baptism. And uh, appreciate the testimony Dylan Furlong gave today in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Boy, take out your insert, and how's that for planning, huh? Look at that. Yeah. You'll never forget this sermon. Yeah. All right, plus, look at that, front, you're getting two sermons in one. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Some of y'all, what, what? Don't worry about the clock. Don't worry about the clock. Uh, my lovely retired wife has ribs cooking at home, so we'll get out, I promise you. We won't be here forever. We will get out. And uh, titled my message, End Times Are Here Again, Again. You remember that? Like two weeks ago, I did End Times Are Here Again. And uh, boy, every time, I don't know about y'all, but in my lifetime, it's just like every time uh, an earthquake, a tsunami, you know, any kind of a war breaks out, anything, oh, it's getting close to Jesus coming back. Now, one thing I can tell you is it's 2,000 years closer than when he left. Okay, and uh, we're going to look at some of this today because I I really want us as a church and you and your family uh, to understand why Jesus told us about end times, the events of end times, and uh, and the happenings of end times uh, to the point of what we need to know as followers of Christ, okay? And so, uh, just to kind of review, uh, last time that we uh, met and were together, we looked at Mark 13, 1 through 27, which was quite a bit then, and verse 1 through 8, we looked at where Jesus basically says, don't be deceived, don't be deceived. That is one of the focal points of those verses that we read in verse 1 through 8 of chapter 13 of Mark. Um, He gives a warning, beware of, beware of father of lies. The Lord uh, specifically wants us to know that Satan's going to try to mislead us. He's the father of lies. That's his whole game, basically. Um, So over and over again, you'll hear the theme, be on the alert, Uh, be careful, be watchful. And now he says, watch out for false Christ. Now, if you're a follower of Christ, you should hopefully immediately be able to recognize a false Christ, okay? Jesus wasn't talking to us when he says, beware of false Christ. He's talking to the Jews. They are the ones that are still looking for who? The Messiah. They don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, They're not Christ followers, so they're still looking for the Messiah. So when Jesus was talking about false Christ, he was actually talking to the Jews. When he was talking to the church, we looked at 2 Peter chapter 2, when Peter warns us about false teachers, false teachers, those who would lead us astray or off the path of following Christ. Um, Then, verse 9 through 13, don't be afraid. Over and over and over and over again. Literally, any preacher could probably preach every Sunday on fear not. It's in the Bible so many times. Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus said it many, many times. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Why would he say that if there was stuff to be afraid of? We don't have to be afraid. And I mentioned the famous quote by Franklin Delano Roosevelt right after the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor where he was before Congress and he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And Jesus did not want us to live in fear, mostly because what? We already won. He won the battle. He won it when he died on the cross. So we have victory. That's our victory in Jesus. So we don't have anything to fear. And he tells us, I told you, alerted you, warned you, so we don't have anything to fear. When we see it happening, we're like, hmm, Jesus told us 
that stuff was going to happen, okay? So we don't have to be afraid or fearful of Jesus' second coming. Jesus is going to come. And the last thing we talked about last time was don't be ignorant, okay? It's important to know the prophetic scriptures, Revelation, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, those kinds of books, Revelation, of course. Um, So we don't be in the dark about what's going to happen and and be misled by the enemy. Um, We don't want to have... Uh, going around going, well, what's going on? What's happening? We don't understand this. And I'm just telling you, Jesus told us exactly what we needed to know. Okay? The emphasis is on knowing what the Scriptures teach. Look at verse 23 of chapter 13. All right? My Bible, red letter edition, it's Jesus talking. Okay? I don't know about you, but when Jesus says something, I'm listening. All right, I'm paying attention. Hold it, memorize it. What? Look what he says. Take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. So, I know some of y'all got to be careful because there's these guys on TV and they write a lot of books and they make some really cool slick videos and all that. And they're going to try to tell you what? There's secret Bible codes that nobody knows about, and I've discovered them. A new revelation. And what do I always say? When somebody says, God gave me a new revelation, what? Run. Don't walk. Run the other way. Any preacher, any teacher, anybody that says, oh, God... Gave me a new revelation. No, he didn't. I'll just flat out say it. No, he didn't. You know why? Because this is it right here. This is all of it. Jesus said, I have told you every, everything you need to know is in this book. And so you don't have to worry about all the other stuff. That's why it's called the book of Revelation. Not revelations. Not revelations. Because there's one revelation, and that's it. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. Verse 24 through 27 are descriptive of the end of the tribulation and the coming of Christ. So just be aware of those things. That's the review that we're looking at. Today we're looking at the uh, wrap up verse 28 through 37 and guess what then I'm done preaching through the entire book of Mark so let's stand and read that passage verse 28 through 37 of Mark chapter 13 now and it's just a continuation of Jesus teaching on end time second coming events. Now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and put forth its forth its leaves, you know that the summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed. Keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, has commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. In the case, he should come suddenly and find you asleep. So you don't want to be caught asleep. And then what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Okay, so may God bless the reading, the understanding, and the doing of his word. You may be seated. There's three points of emphasis here that I want to share with you. And then we're going to look at uh, some of the things here in this handout that I gave you. First of all, 
his disciples should have discernment concerning end times events. That's part of that. I've told you everything, okay? Everything that you need to know. That doesn't mean every minute detail. And let me just help you, especially when you get into looking at the book of Revelation. Um, understand that John wrote what he saw. That's what he says. He says it over and over again. I saw. Write what you see. Write it down. Well, a lot of what John saw, he didn't even know what he was looking at. Okay? And I've been looking at all this stuff and studying it. When I was a little kid, I remember sometime in the early 70s, uh, there was even a movie that came out, okay, by Hal Lindsey, and it was a book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Anybody remember reading that? Where were you people? I was like <laughs> seven years old. I was interested in all that. I mean, ooh, that, and I, we went and saw the movie. I remember going to see it. You know, Hal Lindsey's Church of Christ, theologian. And, uh, and it was all about the second coming and end times and all these kinds of things. And, um, but the reality is we don't have to know every single detail. Jesus has told us exactly what we need to know. And he wants his disciples to have discernment concerning end times events. That's why he pointed out... It's kind of like a fig tree when you look at it. You know, when it's barren, that's wintertime, okay? But when the, green, the leaves start getting green, then you know pretty soon summer's here and you're going to have some fruit, okay? And so that take that, think about it. That means do we need to study and read about what Jesus said and what God says and told his prophets? Yes, absolutely, but the point of it all is in following Christ. It's not in head knowledge of end times prophecy. It's the gospel. How does it all fit and work for us what we're called to do? Jesus, Jesus did not say, go study, 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 study. Go do a book study of Revelation. Go do a book study of Ezekiel. Go do a book study of Daniel get a prophecy group together and try to figure out when the, the numerical code that will lead you to the day. Remember my fame, the thing I mentioned last week? I think none of y'all admitted y'all read that either. Uh, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. That was a bestseller, by the way. And then what did the guy do? He wrote another book next year called... 89, one more reason why Jesus is coming in 1989. Oops, and then I think after that everybody figured it out that the guy didn't know what he was talking about. But we'll go by all these books, these videos. We'll hear or see somebody with a slick presentation on TV, and we swarm to it. And, folks, I'm just going to tell you, end times makes a lot of money, lot millions and millions of dollars. Now, I'm not saying those people aren't Christian. I'm just saying it's profitable to keep writing books about end times events. People really like to read that stuff and buy that. That's not the point of the Christian life. Is to get a bunch of head knowledge about what is exactly going to happen. Look at verse 32 and 33. So first of all, disciples should have discernment concerning end times events. Verse 32 and 33 here it is, but of that day or hour, no one knows. Oh, Jesus, this is Jesus talking, the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. But Brother Stephen, I read where this one guy said he figured it out. He calculated it up, the, you know, the prophecies of Daniel and the, all this stuff, and he, and he knows. No, he doesn't. <laughs> a matter of fact, I'll just say he's a liar. You know why? Because Jesus says he's a liar. Because Jesus said no one knows. Take heed, verse 33, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. And in verse 32, he says the angels don't know, 
The son doesn't know. Jesus does not even know. When he was walking on the earth, he did not know. All right. I want you to repeat after me, okay? No one knows. Say it louder. No one knows. All right. So don't come up to me and say, Brother Stephen, boy, you got to hear this guy or read this guy's book or, you know, go watch this video or whatever because I'm just going to tell you in Mark 32, Jesus said no one knows, period, end of sentence, okay? And we're not supposed to sit around worrying about it. You know what we're supposed to be doing? Telling people about Jesus, sharing his love, being light in darkness until he comes back, all right? And then the third thing is his disciples should be in a state of preparedness that's on the alert. In verse 37 at the very end of that passage when he says, what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Um, In verse 23, I wanted to point out something. When Jesus says, take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance, don't go trying to have Bible studies with revelations with lost people. All you're going to do is confuse them. Jesus said, take heed, behold, I have told you, his followers, his children. That's what it's for. It's not for the lost people. It's for the saved people. They don't need to know all of the stuff that's going to happen at end times. What they need to know is God loves them and sent his only begotten son to die on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. That's the gospel message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So we are to be on the alert, not so we can build up our kingdom or our fortress so we can uh, gather up all of our ammunition. So we, I mean, I've had people tell me they've got more guns and ammunition than, uh, you know, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, military base or whatever. Um, What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to let Jesus fight our battles. Amen? And listen, all he's got to do is snap his fingers, blow with the breath and all his enemies will be dealt dealt with. Our banner is the cross. Now think about what the cross symbolizes. It symbolizes sacrifice. Oh, it symbolizes death. It means giving yourself up. That's pretty much what this final passage covers and gives us. Now what I wanted to do is finish up by showing you, and I've taught this on various different occasions, this little handout here, and you, you can take that out. And the first thing we're going to look at is three purposes in God giving us the book of Revelation, okay? And here's what I want you to know. I actually taught this. I, I found it uh, it's sitting on my desk, the handout I made in 1999, okay? And I titled this exact same message right here, And I was a youth minister at that time for our youth, but I titled it Y2K Jesus. Remember Y2K? It's the end of the world. All the computers are going to crash because one digit. And I mean people bought uh, water purifiers and dehydrated food, and they stored up ammunition and all that stuff. And I mean everybody was freaking out, and they were having conferences, Bible conferences, People sold the, every, all their property and everything. And you know what happened on January 1st, 2000? Nothing. Yeah, we were still there. I had our youth group, we had a lock-in that night. I mean, I, I was like, hey, if, if this is it and Jesus is coming back, let's all have a lock-in and then go to heaven. I, I couldn't think of anything better to do. Uh, but no, we were all still there. Folks, that just makes Christians look dumb. We end up with egg on our face. That's why it's not for the world. It's for us. Okay? So, what is, what is he trying to tell us? The three purposes in God giving us the book of Revelation and Jesus' teaching on second coming. Number one, 
challenge complacent Christians to wake up. That's it. This is one of those verses nobody likes to hear, don't like to preach on it, but Revelation chapter 3, verse 2 through 3, the church of Sardis, but I think it applies to us here in this area. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember that you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come. Okay. It's a challenge. That's what Hannah prayed a while ago, to be challenged. Well, I'm, I, here it is. Here's the challenge from this passage and in God giving us the book of Revelation. It's to wake up, Christians. Quit worrying about the day or the hour or the time or, you know, whose army is going to be doing this or that or whatever. The purpose of all of it is for us to wake up and start living for Jesus each and every day. Oh, and by the way, if you carry uh, read the rest of that passage in Revelation chapter uh, 3 and you get to verse 16, basically he calls the church at Sardis lukewarm and he says, if you don't straighten up, repent, Wake up, I will spew you out of my mouth. Quit being a lukewarm Christian. Start living for Jesus. Keep on doing it. Keep on trying. Clear perspective of a second coming event is the second thing. So that you have understanding about exactly what it is that is about Jesus coming back. Three things are listed there. Judgment is righteous. It's not our judgment. It's his judgment. And his judgment is perfect. So quit worrying about it. Jesus is the righteous judge. God is in control of it all. So it, Russia invading Ukraine, what's happening in Gaza with Israel and all that. Is China going to invade Taiwan? Uh, all of these different things. Listen, God's in control of it all. He doesn't wake up and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe Russia invaded Ukraine today. Listen, he already knows everything that's going to happen until G Jesus comes back. And then he knows what's going to happen after that. Everything. God is in control of it all. And basically, remember this, bad things are going to happen not because God's some mean God, and he's running an experiment. He, you know, there's people, I can't believe God would allow the killing of all these children, like, like what's happening over there in Gaza. You think God's pleased by that? No. Let me tell you something. God is allowing those things to happen because we have free will. We're not puppets. And basically, what's happening to this world is exactly what God said was going to happen. Pride, rebellion, single-mindedness, greed, self-serving ways, it all leads up to death and destruction. That's why Jesus is going to come back to put an end to all that. Famine, starving, suffering, death, all of that will be ended when Jesus comes back. And he is coming back. That's the last point of the assurance for final victory. And we read that a little bit earlier, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7 through 14. First time Jesus came as a baby, as an infant. The second time he's coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords. So that's the three purposes in God giving us the book of Revelation. It's not so we know every single detail about the second coming or can figure out in a, some secret way exactly the day or the time or the hour. Quit worrying about all that. Wake up and let's live for Jesus. The four main characteristics of Jesus' second coming. Everyone will see him, okay? It's not going to be a secret. There's no secret coming. When Jesus comes back, everyone will know. Everyone will know. Matter of fact, Revelation 19, verse 11, this is a great verse for all you rodeo people and cowboys and horse people. It says Jesus comes back on a white horse. So are there animals in heaven? Well, there's your answer, all right? Now, 
Maybe it's got wings or something. I don't know, but he is coming on a white horse. It will be visible. It's a bodily return. It's Jesus in his glorified state, okay? And in Acts chapter 1, if you read, the angels are there when, the all, when Jesus ascends to go be with the Father. He's already been resurrected. He's been on the earth for a certain amount of time. He ascends to go be with the Father, and they're all standing there looking up, and the angel says, what are you staring at? This same Jesus that you're watching go up is going to come back in the exact same way. Everyone will see him. There's no doubt about who he is or what's happening. People aren't going to go, oh, my gosh, I wonder if that's Jesus coming back. Believe me, when the trumpet sounds and the host of heaven comes down, you will know. You're not going to miss it, okay? And everybody else that's on the earth won't miss it either. But for God's children, it'll be a time of glory and celebration. For those who have rejected Christ, it'll be a time of mourning and weeping. Number two, he will come suddenly and unexpectedly. It's it's described over and over. I mentioned this last week, so I'm not going to go back into it. Not last week, the week before. It's like birth pains, okay? They just all of a sudden, boom, they happen. Now, I didn't have a baby, but I was there when my wife had some babies, and I remember some of that, those times where all of a sudden the labor pains hit, and there's no preparing for it. There's no getting ready for it. There's no, it's just all of a sudden it's there, and Jesus uses that to describe what it'll be like when he comes, and I shared Uh, In 1998, when I was at Super Summer at East Texas Baptist University, uh, and this is for also for all those who think they can figure out when Jesus is coming back, it's kind of like doctors. And, you know, we went to the doctor because it was close. I knew it was getting close. And the doctor told Melody, "Uh, I don't think anything's going to happen this week. Yeah. And so, of course, me trying to be the good youth pastor, I was like, I'm going to go ahead and go to Super Summer. And I'm at Super Summer. It was up in uh, East Texas. It's up near Tyler. Bridge City is about a four and a half hour drive. And uh, I think it was about Wednesday night, about 2 a.m. in the morning. I didn't even have a cell phone back then. Somebody let me borrow their cell phone. And I took it with me, and my phone went off. It was my wife. My water broke. Jamie's, which was one of our real good friends from Bridge City, Jamie's taking me to the hospital. Hung up, jumped out of bed, got in the car, sped as fast as I could. And I've shared this before, my one mess up, I didn't fill the car up with gas. (laughs) Talk about never living that down. So I missed Alan's birth by about five minutes. And it was because I had to stop and fill up. Ugh. Okay, lesson learned. Keep that tank full. Anyways, suddenly and unexpectedly, you do not know. And so what does he say? Be ready. Be on alert. Be ready because you don't know. We're supposed to be kind of like Boy Scouts. You know, be prepared. So how do you be prepared? Make sure you know Jesus. Make sure you know Jesus. Make sure your friends know Jesus. Your neighbors know Jesus. Your kids know Jesus. Make sure you know Jesus and tell as many people as you can about Jesus and his love and what he did for us on that cross. Number three, he'll come during a great time of cosmic disruption. Volcanoes, earthquakes. Have have you all ever looked at a thing of all the junk that's flying around up in space? 1957. 1957, there was uh, the first satellite, Sputnik, okay? Now, there's so much space junk flying around, and there's all kinds of stuff, and some, every once in a while something falls down out of heaven. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to look like, but you can look at some of these verses, and we're not going to read all those. You can go look them up for yourself. But when it gets closer and closer and closer to Jesus coming back, you're going to see more cosmic disruption. We've already seen some things, earthquakes, volcanoes, we've always had some of that. Is it getting worse? I don't know. Maybe. I I think the news just whoops it up more now. But that's one of the signs that it is getting closer, and I think we could all agree, yeah, 
it's probably getting closer. Um, and then number four, he will come in all of his glory and power. Now, I mentioned before, he came humble as a baby, born in a manger, a stable, the poorest of the poor. But this next time when he comes, he's coming as the king of kings and lord of lords with a host of heaven. Host of heaven means an angel army is coming with him. And this time, he's not just coming to be meek and mild. He's coming to take over his kingdom, okay? And so there's going to be a trumpet blast, and then you're going to see the glory of the Lord, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 10 through 11, Revelation 5, 13, it's in the scriptures at least two times. When Jesus comes back, everyone will know it. And everyone will acknowledge that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And so the question, though, is are you ready? Are you ready for that day? What if, what if it were today? There's actually a gospel song titled, What If It Were Today? Man, what if, what if before we left this building, the earth split open, you heard the trumpet blast, and here comes Jesus on a white horse with all of his angels? Are you ready? The Bible says we are to eagerly await his coming, anticipate it, desire it, pray for it, the return of our king. That's what we are here to look forward to. Now, when's it going to be? I don't know. I do know this. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, this to me is one of the most eye-opening passages about the second coming. Chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to the young preacher and he says this, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, Malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Man, so what I'm telling you there is from what Paul is writing, um, just know that there's a real good chance that we'll have to live through some pretty tough stuff. All this idea, I just, I'm not a big fan of the idea that we're going to rapture out before any bad stuff starts happening. I'm more of a mid-trib person. I think that we'll have to go through at least the first part of the tribulation then the wrath of God pours out, and we don't have to experience that if you're covered by the blood of Christ because all God's wrath was poured out on the cross. So if you're covered by the blood of Christ, then you're not going to have to experience that. But the first part of the tribulation is when Satan is let loose. Folks, look around. Who do you think's in charge of this world right now? So we may be experiencing some of that right now. So am I saying it's happening? So I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that we're supposed to eagerly anticipate it. Be on the alert. Yes, pray for it. Desire it. Want Jesus to come back because it'll put an end to all suffering. Wars, famine, hatred. Death, all of that will be gone when Jesus comes back. I'm ready to go. Are you? Let's pray. Almighty God and Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing your word to speak to our hearts today, to inform us, to, to let us know exactly what we need to know from the words of Jesus, our Savior himself. We need to be on the alert. We need to be watchful and know that Jesus could come at any time or any hour. And we need to continue like a good servant 
accomplishing the task that he gave us to go and make disciples of all nations, to go and be his witnesses, tell people about Jesus and his love. Father God, take this time and use it for your glory. Pray that you would speak to our hearts. May when we leave this place, we be more committed to sharing your love and your light with a dark and dying world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.